Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Ori Back. I'm the CEO of TrapX Security. Uh, we are a vendor of cybersecurity solutions. And uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about uh, different ways uh, where you can make your security program a lot more effective uh, at stopping uh, different types of advanced attacks. And I'm going to do so by using a discipline, a science called game theory. Uh, why is this valuable? I know that many of you uh, spend your day-to-day -day looking at uh, cybersecurity or the cybersecurity challenge from a very technical aspect. Uh, you know, uh, we do the same. Is it uh, a, a, an issue of, uh, of on-prem? Is it an issue that can be stopped with, with an antivirus, a firewall, uh, IDS, IPS? Uh, should we stop at the perimeter? Should we stop it uh, inside the network? Uh, those are all valid things, by the way. However, with all of those, uh, uh, with all of those things and so many tools and uh, the MITRE attack framework and this attack and that attack, sometimes we lose, uh, we lose sight of the bigger picture. What is the bigger picture? The bigger picture is ultimately uh, that there are people out there, malicious actors uh, that are out uh, to cause some damage and uh, our job as uh, security professionals or IT professionals is to stop them. And I believe that the science of game theory uh, can give us some insights as to how we, how we can do it in the right way and how we can do it in the wrong way. Uh, why don't we go and kind of look at the different actors uh, that exist within the cybersecurity space and how, what is that they're trying to achieve? So first of all, uh, the people that have caused this entire problem are the attackers. There are no malicious actors. Uh, then there would be no need for cybersecurity. Uh, broadly speaking, I know there are some kind of more specific use cases. It's either uh, financial motivation, mostly by stealing data and monetizing it, like credit cards and financial records and medical records, or maybe encrypting data with ransomware and then monetizing it using uh, ransomware. And occasionally for uh, actors that have political motivations, it's about disrupting operations, right? Shutting down the power. Uh, wreaking havoc in an election. Uh, so those are, uh, uh, those are different types of motivation and, and, and those attackers are the ones that are essentially uh, causing uh, uh, the cybersecurity problem uh, and therefore we have, uh, uh, we invest in cybersecurity. The side of defenders, security professionals, IT professionals, uh, CISOs, Security Operations Center, all of them are ultimately tasked with making sure uh, that the bad things that attackers are trying to do will not happen. So their job is to protect the data and to protect the operation. And they have a challenge that uh, as they do so, they cannot, of course, disrupt too much the day-to-day -day operation of the business, right? So if I wanted to create really great security, I could ask everybody at TrapEx to never connect to the internet. But uh, then we would be, as a company, extremely inefficient. So it's about providing security, but doing so in a manner that is cost effective and does not disrupt the legitimate, the, the, the business, the core business of whatever, uh, uh, whatever organization we're trying to protect. And the final actor within, the, uh, within this game, and we sometimes uh, forget about them, but they are important, are the legitimate users. Those would typically be the victims of uh, different types of attacks. And they're just trying to do their job and, uh, and they're trying to be efficient about it and they don't want to cause cybersecurity problems, but ultimately for them, it's uh, some kind of hassle or some kind of uh, additional requirements that are coming from elsewhere. Um, what, I want to, uh, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, the fact that today uh, in a normal, uh, in the usual kind of uh, business of cybersecurity, Attackers have a significant advantage. Attackers have developed something that's called a dominant strategy. What is a dominant strategy? This is a term from the science of, of game theory. A dominant strategy is when you uh, act in a way that uh, regardless of what, the, what your opponent, in the case of the attackers, their opponent is the cybersecurity team, the defenders, regardless of what the defenders do, over time, they will win, they will achieve in, in getting their goals. Their goals, of course, stealing the data, disrupting operations. And I wanna convince you that attackers today have a dominant strategy. Let's talk about what is the strategy that for the most part uh, attackers are using. First of all, uh, attackers typically mimic legitimate user activity. They try to impersonate a user, social engineer a user, and they do so because they understand that the defenders uh, will always 
need to allow the users to have access to data and therefore it would be expensive. It will always be difficult and expensive if they do a good enough job of looking like a legitimate user to stop them. The second thing that attackers do is they make sure that when they run attacks, uh, at least if they're, if they're smart, they do so in a manner that's anonymous uh, and they do so in a manner uh, where even if they are detected, there is no penalty to it. A very simple way to do that would be to be physically located in a geography, in a jurisdiction where you will not be persecuted should you be caught, uh, should, should, should you be detected in the hacking attempt. So as long as I'm not uh, careless and I don't uh, uh, hack a target and, and make myself easily identifiable, and as long as I'm not in a territory, in a country where, uh, uh, where, hacking, uh, where hacking other countries is persecuted, a lot of countries don't have, uh, uh, don't have a policy or don't have extradition agreements with uh, the United States and, 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 and Europe and other places. As long as they do that, I have unlimited chances to win. Meaning that if I made a hacking attempt and it failed, I just try again and again and again and again because there is really no penalty for uh, making those attempts. A single attempt, a single successful breach would get me to the data and I can monetize the data and that would give me a good enough return investment. So this is the strategy of the attackers and essentially they are setting the rules for the game. The typical strategy for defenders uh, is one that, uh, uh, that essentially they don't really know where attackers are going to strike next. Uh, they don't know if the, the uh, controls, the products they put out there are good enough until the attack happens. Uh, ultimately a single breach could be catastrophic. Uh, security is one of the single professions where even if you have, let's say, a 99.9% .9 success rate, you've stopped 99.9% .9 of the attacks, but a single attack succeeds and you've lost all of your data, that's still horrible. It could cost a lot to the business. And security is, to, is today constantly uh, needing to prioritize, okay, how much money do I spend on security? How much time do I spend on security? How disruptive are the security controls going to be to the legitimate user activity? And ultimately it requires 100% effectiveness. So within this equation, as you can understand, the attackers have a huge advantage and the defenders have a disadvantage, meaning that attackers can, uh, uh, don't need to work that hard and still be successful and defenders work very hard and ultimately over time will be unsuccessful. This is why Security is still such a big problem after many years uh, of a lot of investment and a lot of, uh, of things being done. It's still actually a growing problem. There are today more breaches than there were last year and there were, uh, uh, and there are probably going to be more next year. I want to, uh, uh, to offer a different way of doing things and I'm going back to the problem. The problem is that the uh, attackers and legitimate users are ultimately uh, in the same place. So of course I have authentication solutions and they're very good ones, but uh, uh, I, I still need to, in some way, create an option for people to authenticate because of the legitimate users and attackers will use that in order to circumvent those authentication solutions. There are great firewalls out there, but all firewalls have rules where there are various holes within the firewall. And again, this is what the attacker would use to come in. There are great monitoring solutions uh, in order to detect uh, breaches. But once again, the only thing that the attacker needs to do is to look like some kind of legitimate user. Uh, and, uh, and therefore it would, uh, it would either not be detected or there would be too many false positives in order to effectively, uh, effectively detect him. And this would allow him to get to the data that he wants to get to. So this is the current situation. What I want to tell you about today that there's a different way of doing things. And we, the defenders, should start using a new tactic, which typically we don't use, called deception. And deception, or cyber deception, or distributed deception platforms, there are many names for it, is a way for defenders to control the rules of the game and essentially uh, feed attackers misinformation in order to, uh, to stop attacks, in order to detect attacks, in order to divert attacks away from the real high value assets. Think about this uh, uh, in, in the sense like a free shell game. Sometimes it's done with cops, there's a little ball and, uh, and the dealer essentially moves the, the cops or the shells around and, and uh, the other guy needs to guess where the ball is. And if, if any of you have ever done this game in the street, it's done by typically by uh, people on the street, you will see that over time, you will always lose because 
uh, it's relatively easy to trick once you, uh, it's relatively easy to misinform the human eye regarding where the ball is. Think about this ball as your data. If you, if you are able to move this data around and actually create uh, uh, deceptive environments, uh, in this analogy, the two cups that are empty, this would give you a huge advantage and would make sure that you win over time. If we're able to do that, the picture changes. Now, my users can still authenticate, go for the firewall and do their business as usual. My attacker, I've created an, another environment for him, a deceptive environment. And with this, in this environment, only he lives. So uh, I can make sure that, uh, uh, that only he can authenticate and uh, it's very easy to detect him because he's the only one with this environment. This is a fake environment that we've built only for our attackers. In this environment, I, the defender, control everything. I even control the movements of the attacker. I control what data he's seeing. I control what he's doing. And I have full visibility into it. What this does is essentially uh, changes the following things. First of all, and this is a huge benefit, attackers are diverted away from the real high value assets, the real data, the real uh, operations that they're trying to disrupt. And uh, they're being diverted away from that into this deceptive environment this environment with fake assets. By the fact that they're touching any of those fake assets, this is an environment that has no legitimate business use. It was created only for the purpose of the attackers. By the fact that they're touching any of those deceptive elements, their activity is now exposed. So I know exactly uh, that they are in my network. I know what they're doing. I know how they're doing. I know how long they're doing it. And also I can feed them bad, bad data. I can misinform the attacker. I can misinform them regarding how my network looks like. I can misinform them on what my data is. I can misinform them regarding where they've landed. So now I control the entire, uh, the entire game. That is exactly what we do at TrapX Security. Uh, so what, what our solution does is essentially uh, make attacks fail and what our technology is able to do is to spin very large attack surfaces, which are completely separate than the real, uh, uh, than the real network, the real, uh, the real devices, the real servers, the real workstations. And essentially when an attacker breaches a network, the first thing that he would hit or be diverted into are those deceptive, uh, uh, are those deceptive sur surfaces. And from that point on, essentially we control the attack. So the attack by definition has failed. The attacker is captured within our deceptive environment. And from that point on, we decide what he sees and what he does. We do so by uh, deploying, first of all, uh, different types of uh, baits or lures. Essentially, we put out clues for attackers. Automatically, we put out clues for attackers that make them think that there are high value targets out there that actually do not exist. And B, we actually deploy fake high value targets. Those are traps. Those are emulated traps that we create. Essentially, they emulate or simulate uh, various things that attackers want to compromise or want to steal, be it an IoT device like a printer, uh, be it even uh, a switch, uh, security solution, a server, uh, a user, a laptop. Uh, and essentially, the attackers from that point on are convinced that uh, this is the actual targets. And uh, the minute that they touch any of those targets, as I mentioned, we're able to detect the attack, we're able to record their activity. Here are some of the benefits of, uh, of doing so, and, uh, uh, and I wanna go over uh, each one of them. We have uh, some great uh, customer case studies. This is not uh, just something that works in theory, it works in practice. One of those case studies uh, is a case study that we have with Procter & Gamble. They are the world's largest manufacturer of consumer goods, a Fortune 50 company. And the three things that happen when our solution is being deployed is first of all, attacks fail because attackers simply are being fed bad data. They don't understand what the network actually looks like. They make wrong decisions. The second thing that happens is that an attack becomes a lot more time consuming for the attacker because an attacker now spends most of his time in deceptive environment. He needs to constantly question if what he's seeing is real or fake. Uh, if he takes data, he doesn't know if that data is real or fake. So now he doesn't have the confidence in that data. That data is less valuable. The security team uh, stops uh, spending their time searching for attacks and going through false positives, but actually knows what the attacks are and they can move from uh, uh, damage control to actually uh, stopping future attacks. And they have a very good understanding of attacker activities, how they went in, 
Attackers essentially discover, tell us everything about themselves as they interact with our deceptive environment. And, and the end result that it makes uh, uh, that it makes the organization a harder, less lucrative target. Procter and Gamble had a great quote in the case study. This turned our 12-hour days to eight-hour days. So just this, this uh, the 12-hour days, eight-hour days relates to the security operations center. And the Gartner, the analyst firm, also did uh, a couple of great reports. One of them is available from our website, and uh, uh, it's very consistent. Organization that have chosen deception over other approaches to threat detection, report detecting threats with a low false positive rate, radically simpler deployment, lower costs, and less operational burden. So this is easy to deploy, and it works very well because essentially we're putting the burden on the attacker and not on the security team. Um, I touch at the high level of the concept. I'm sure many of you are technical people and now have technical questions, which is how do you deploy those emulations? What is the bait? How do you ensure that attackers get to it? Uh, and other types of things. Uh, we'd be happy to share that information. The best way to do so uh, would be to visit our virtual booth. Uh, I have a little picture of where it is. Uh, if you guys are using the avatar, it's traffic security. Also, our website has a lot of resources, customer case studies, videos, uh, brochures that explain how we used our product Deception Grid in order to drastically improve security for many verticals, manufacturing, healthcare, finance, and many more. And uh, what I'd like you to take away from this, uh, uh, from this uh, session is, uh, well, you, well, all of us are doing really great things and we're installing more solutions and we're putting more security people and we're putting more process. Ultimately, uh, attackers have the upper hand and breaches are on the rise. And I'd like you to think, to talk to us and think about, can you get the upper hand? Can you change the rules of the game and, uh, and essentially do to attackers what they've been doing to us for many years, uh, you know, deceive them and how that would change uh, the entire way that you manage security. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions and if not, uh, uh, turn it over back to, uh, uh, to our moderators. Благодарим вас. Ори, а сейчас, если у кого-то есть какие-то вопросы, пожалуйста, вы можете их написать. Вопросов нет. Еще раз большое спасибо.